I'm uh, Matt Calder. I'm uh, with Mellon. We're a BNY Mellon company. I'm here with my colleague, Jin Wen, who helped me with this work. It's uh, controlling confounders with random forests. So what I'd like to do in the next 25 minutes or so is give you a hint of who we are and give you a hint of the kinds of problems we face and why we're using models to solve it. And then I'd also like to describe this specific problem because I suspect that a lot of you have this problem as well and you might benefit from how we solved it. Uh, first, let me talk about ourselves because I guess that's why I'm here. We're a BNY Mellon company. Uh, we are the execution platform within Mellon, which is a subsidy, it's a sub company of BNY Mellon. Uh, we are the execution platform for a uh, asset manager, we manage, we do the trading for the asset manager, we don't make the investment decisions. They tell us what they want to buy, they tell us what they want to sell, and we do it for them. We are an attempt to automate and modernize the execution platform within the asset manager. You've probably all heard software is eating the world, and you might wonder why we weren't an early appetizer perhaps an amuse-bouche, right? We are, most, for the most part, trading is mostly electronic. Um, it's all numbers. Why are we now, so far into the software revolution, only now getting to the point of automation? And the reason is, actually, Dan, you sort of hinted at some of the problems we face. Um, it's sort of, there's sort of three challenges that we face. First off, it's high risk. It's a lot of money involved. Our asset manager alone manages half a trillion dollars. So every day we trade a lot of money. If the machine messes that up, that's a disaster, right? So you can't have a machine uh, responsible for things that are high risk in general. Uh, the second reason is it's adversarial. We're here with Wayfair. When Wayfair accomplishes a, a, a a recommendation, both parties are happy, right? Somebody walks away with a chair they really love, Wayfair gets a cut, everybody's happy. When we make a good trade, the guy we traded with lost. They know that, we know that. We're trying to compete with our counterparties, okay? That means if your model isn't really, really good, you're gonna get taken advantage of and you're gonna get wiped out. So it's difficult to automate in that environment. And lastly, is that we are heavily regulated. Uh, we are regulated from within by our client compliance team. I, had, I, I wish I could show you the markup they did to these slides. You'll see footnotes all over these slides that make no sense, they're ridiculous. That's our compliance team in action. We're regulated by the government in a serious and significant way. Everything we do is regulated. If we tell our regulators, compliance or otherwise, that we're trading in a black box and we can't really explain why we did that, there's gonna be hell to pay. So the reason uh, execution in financial services is so slow to this party is for those principal reasons. Nevertheless, we're gonna try. What I'm gonna talk about is confounding. Some of you statisticians probably know what confounding is. Some of you data analysts probably should know what confounding is. Um, confounding occurs when you're trying to study a treatment, the effect of a treatment on an outcome. I'm gonna use the statistical jargon. And confounding is a complication that happens if there's a factor lurking in the world that's affecting both of those things. It's affecting the thing you're interested in, the outcome, and it's affecting the treatment, the thing you're trying to associate with that outcome so you can learn about it. It can really mess you up. It can reduce or reverse the associations that you see in the data and basically lead to incorrect conclusions. I'm gonna give you two examples from our real live TCA, trading cost analysis, that are subject to confounding. I hope they're interesting because they also have some finance in them and maybe you'll learn a little bit about finance in the, in the process. So let me, let me dive right into those examples. I'd like to introduce this. Um, I, I, teach, I teach English to adults, and as a conversation starter, I like to ask them, how does Google work? 
And I invariably get the obvious answer. I type the word into Google and I get the web pages back. It's easy. Um, but of course, what I really mean is, you know, how does it work? So I'm gonna ask you, because you're probably all holders of IRAs and 401ks, how does an ETF work? I didn't know. But it's very complicated. So I'm gonna try to enlighten you and explain to you quickly how an ETF works because it's relevant to what we do, which is trade. An ETF is, you probably know, a uh, uh, security. It's traded on an exchange, an exchange traded fund. It's a security that represents a fund. Most common ETF probably out there is capturing the S&P. So it's a, it's a single security that is a share of the S&P 500. What's going on in the background there? There's a guy who set up a, a fund and he bought 500 stocks and he put them, put them in a box somewhere and then he sold uh, shares that are pieces of the value of that fund. If that were the end of the story, it would be really boring. Okay? That's, that's the sort of superficial, that's the I type the words into the thing, I get the web pages back explanation. What's really happening is he set up the opportunity for others to come to him with a basket of stocks, boom, give me a share of the ETF. That's called a creation event. He's creating shares in the ETF. Somebody goes to them, here's some actual shares, give me the share in the ETF. And the reverse process, it's called a redemption. I have a share in the ETF, hey buddy, give me those 500 stocks, okay? This happens constantly day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out, um, all day. We actually manage ETFs at our firm. Some of our bright fixed income traders noticed that this is an opportunity. Bonds are notoriously difficult to trade. It costs a lot to trade a bond. It's like buying and selling a house. You don't just do it casually. It's very expensive. They're illiquid. They're expensive to trade. Stocks are very cheap to trade. You probably all know this. You can go on your phone and trade for free, right? Stocks are easy to trade. An ETF is a stock, right? So what these traders noticed is they could go to the ETF, redeem a share in the ETF, and receive back not S&P 500 because the ETF is a bond ETF. They could receive back bonds. You take those bonds and they've just bought bonds through the mechanism of the ETF, okay? Then they can do the opposite. They can sell bonds. They can take these bonds. They can go to the manager of the ETF and say, here, give me the shares. And then they sell the ETF and they've sold the bonds. I think I just turned off. Nope, that's okay. Um, they can sell the shares of the ETF and, and thereby sell, therefore sell the bonds. So they're selling, they're trading bonds as if it's a stock. It's really cheap. They know that. They want to convince the client. Guys, look how much money we're saving you. So they show basically that right-hand column. Look, when we do these portfolio trades, these ETF trades, it costs 10. Again, compliance, 10 what? 10, you fill in the number. 10 units of value. Regular trades cost 23. Yes, we're saving you money. The problem is the bonds that you, are, the bonds that you can trade with an ETF are different than the bonds that you can't trade with an ETF. So here I've represented it by liquidity. The bonds that you can trade with an ETF are naturally more liquid. What you want to be able to say is all else being equal, it's cheaper to trade with an ETF, but all else is not equal. That's confounding. All right, I'm gonna to come to how we address that after the second example. Second example, how fast should you trade, all right? I don't want to go into all the details of why these things are true, but these things are true. That when you trade faster, it's generally more expensive. Everybody kind of knows that. If you trade really fast, it's going to be more expensive. If you trade slowly, it's less expensive, but you're exposed to risk. Right? Unfortunately, in the real world, the motion of the underlying, let's say, stock, when you're trading, when you're buying, affects, it affects the cost. So if the price action, the motion of the stock while you're trading is favorable, your costs are going to be less because it's moving in your favor. If the motion of the stock is up and you're buying, it's going to be unfavorable. Your costs are going to be higher. 
Okay? At the same time, for complicated market structure, microstructure reasons, if the price action is favorable, the participation rate, the speed at which you trade, is going to be slower. Okay? Higher. Sorry. Higher. You're going to trade faster if the price is moving in your direction for both psychological reasons and just market structure reasons. Okay? And similarly, if the price is moving against you, you're going to trade slower. That's a problem. That's confounding. The motion of the price is affecting the thing you care about, the cost, and the thing you're trying to relate to that cost, the participation rate. All right? So those are two examples, two real life examples that we had in Mellon. What I want to do next is, before I tell you how we work on the solution, I want to break it down into a really simple generative model. I said simulation on the slide, and the compliance said, no, no, this isn't a simulation. It's a simulation. All right? I don't know why. But it's a, it's a model I'm going to generate. I'm in control of all the parameters. I'm going to simulate a thousand times. That's all the little blue dots, which I'll explain in a second. And it's essentially what I described a moment ago. Right? The price you execute at, the fill, is equal to the, does this laser point? Oh, oh cool. Yeah. Is equal to um, the price you started at before you started trading, plus the price action, noise, random noise, plus a multiple of Q. Q is the, the speed at which you trade. The multiplier is a, some positive number. That's the number you want to know. I want to know how fast, what's the effect on the price when I trade at a certain level at a certain speed. That's the thing that I want to know is alpha. And alpha is a positive number. Okay. In this, I will slip between calling it the speed and the quantity. They're the same things for all intents and purposes. It doesn't matter. All right. When, if you simply take that data, I've got my, I'm going to take that price and move it to the other side and express it in cost. I'm going to say, I want to plot my cost against my speed. It's, it's negative. The association's negative. It looks like from the data that the faster I trade, the cheaper I trade. I told you alpha's positive. What's going on? It's confounded. I didn't tell you how I generated the data. I said epsilon was random noise, but where did Q come from? Well, Q, in this case, because of the confounding, is a function of the noise also. And that's the problem. That's the confounding problem. So in this case, Q is just a simple linear function of the epsilon, the noise. Beta, in this case, is negative, which drives that association down. So I did my observational study. I got my data, I plotted it, I said, nope, trade faster. It would have been a totally wrong decision. Alpha's not positive, uh, negative, it's positive. It's going to cost me if I make that call. Right? I, should, I do want to say here, if you were Google or if you were Wayfair, how would you solve this problem? You'd A-B test the hell out of it, right? Remember those compliance guys that are sitting behind me? Experiment on our trades? Are you kidding me? No. So we are stuck in the observational world. We don't have experimental data. We have observational uh, data. Let's look at those points a little bit carefully. On the plot here, what I've done is I've shaded two bands of epsilon. Remember, this is a generative model. This is simulated data. I know what all the numbers are. So for all the cases where epsilon happened to be between 1 and 1.25, I shaded it green. For all the cases when epsilon happened to be between minus 1 and minus 1.25, I shaded it red. Lo and behold, there it is. There is my positive association. It's still in the data. It's just hidden, right? This suggests how we ought to solve this problem. 
This is how we're going to solve the confounding problem, right? We're going to isolate the points that have a specific level of the confounding variable, and we're going to fit a model to those. We're going to get an answer, and we're going to scan across the data. Epsilon is 1, 1, 1 1.25, 1.25 to 1.5, 1.5 to 1.75, da And we're going to average all those up, and bang, we got a great estimate of alpha. Works perfect for this problem. You're going to get a great estimate of this. This problem is pretty simple. Right? It's kind of made up. It's kind of fake. So when you do this for reals, and this is essentially what you know, uh, propensity scoring, um, I've forgotten all the terms. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of literature on how to do this. I'm not making this up. Um, but these questions that are on the bottom here, these are always sort of in the background. What, how do I arrange those strips of epsilon? What, how do I scan? Do I do 1.25? Do I do 0.25? Do I do 0.5? How many should I do? I'm breaking my data up, fitting a model to the pieces, and combining them. Everybody knows statistical efficiency has been lost. Right? What if the confounding isn't simple and simple uh, linear? Then I got a problem, right? This, uh, this whole approach is going to start to break down quick. Random forests, however, provide, and I like to break this down for our PMs, a principled recursive way to uniformly partition the space of covariance. That's when they leave the room. You can't. Uh, principled random forests, what I like to say is, you all know what a neural network is. You are all probably modeled by a random forest today, right? They're everywhere. Well understood, well behaved, and perform awesome, right? Everybody knows that. They partition. You, I hope you know, because I'm not going to really go into the details how they work. A random forest is a collection of trees. The trees break up the space of covariates into regions. Right? That's kind of what we wanted to do, right? We wanted to break that region of covariates into, or break up the covariates into regions. They're uniform. Within a leaf, and this is key. Well, I should back up. What am I fitting the random forest to? I'm, ran I'm fitting the random forest to the treatment, not to the outcome, to the treatment. OK? Within the leaf, the treatment is independent of the covariance. Confounding problem solved, right? Within the leaf, the treatment is independent of the covariance. If the covariance were potential confounders, I'm done. I can then build a model at the leaf, aggregate those together, and it's a win. All right, there's a, there's a few ins and outs and what have yous. First off, you got to be able to observe the confounders, right? In our example, for the ETF trading, let's just break down what they are. The outcome was the cost. The treatment was whether they traded it as an ETF or a regular trade. And then we have a whole slew of covariates. We don't know. We have no idea exactly what the structure or composition of the confounding is. We know there's confounding. We can, it's observe, the, confound, the, the fact that there's confounding is observable. But we're pretty sure that it's in the space of these variables. We're pretty sure that if there's another variable that's, not, that's confounding, that's not in that space, portfolio manager would be using it to make money. So those things are easily partitioned into the other, where we can sort of ignore them. When we did that study, in fact, we were able to demonstrate for the clients that trading via the ETF was significantly cheaper, even when controlling for all the other covariates. It's a big win. Our traders were vindicated, 
and they got to send the message that they were hoping to send. In that case, we have sort of a classic treatment, right? It's a binary treatment. In the second case, the treatment is the speed at which you trade, right? The speed at which you trade is a continuous thing. It's okay, the random forest could care less, right? Classifier, regression, doesn't matter. So it works just as well. In that case, we are predicting with the random forest the speed that you traded, which is observable and knowable. And the covariates are all the things, again, that we think matter in terms of the outcome, which is the cost, or the treatment, which is the speed that you trade. There, what we had formerly, our predecessors had said you should trade this way, we were able to sort of convincingly demonstrate they were completely off base because they didn't uh, account for this confounding. And we were able to correct that and move the, um, the, the way we trade. So that was a nice win as well. Within the trees, there's a lot of great features. I mentioned one. It works for binary. It works for continuous. I don't care. It works for multivariate uh, targets. So if I have multiple treatment variables or a multidimensional treatment variable, which happened, it works just right out of the box. Perfect. You can, so the examples I've been giving have sort of gone for an average treatment effect, but you can easily condition. It's built into the model. Just show me the leaves where x1 X is this and x2 is in this range. Comes right out of the model. It's fantastic. One last point on that is in the case of the ETF where we're trading, we have these covariates. I want you to sort of drill down in your mind. If you know about random force, I want you to think about what's happening here. We're predicting the treatment effect. In some of the leaves, all those bonds were traded as ETF. In some of the leaves, all the bonds were traded in the usual way. In some of the leaves, it was 50-50. Of course, it's continuous, but just bear with me. What is, the, what is this model doing? It's throwing out. It's saying this data is not relevant to this analysis. It's, those bonds were going to be traded as ETF regardless. These bonds are going to be traded not as ETF regardless. Don't mess up your analysis by including them. It's doing it for you. And then you've got this one leaf, of course, it's more than one, where you can then focus your energy of studying. And you can get a very good estimate. All right, wrapping up. Uh, this wasn't our idea. <laughs> we just applied it. Uh, Wagner and Athey have a very good paper on the estimation and inference of heterogeneous treatment effects using random forests uh, in JAZA. Um, there's a couple cool ideas that they, they carried along that really aren't necessary or required in this honest random forest. If you haven't read about that and you're a random forest, aficionado or user, look that one up. That one's key. That one's important. I, I don't know why it doesn't get the, the use. Like Scikit doesn't support it. I don't know why. Hopefully they will soon. Um, they have some interesting splitting rules in their paper. That is, when you do the split, their folk, those splitting rules are focused on this causal problem, but it's, it's, it's interesting nonetheless to see that. And they do some interesting things with the gradient boosting as well. Uh, we may, compliance willing, release our version of their code through a, um, through a pull request probably to their code. That's my colleague Jin Wen is working on that. Uh, kudos to Jin Wen, I don't see her. She's hiding. She knew I was gonna call her name. Um, and so hopefully that might be released soon. That would also include the honest piece, which would be nice. Um, and then this last piece I already talked about. So anybody have questions? Are we supposed to take questions? Okay, All right. Do I have time? Yes. So when you are doing this, I'm sure you are stuck at some point. For example, with the testing, you are going to do observatory testing. And your executives come to you and say, when are we going to get it done? Uh, how do you handle that? When are we going to get? Done. 
CEO and it's done. When is this going to get done? Your executive will come to you and ask, I know you are having all these problems, but no matter what, tell me when you are going to finish your model. So, um, fortunately, we had a, an agenda. <laughs> I think I can say that. No one from compliance is here, right? So, we had an agenda. We believed we were trading too fast. So we put this together and as a demonstration piece, we are trading too fast. So um, done was, we were very fast. Done never came up. They got hit with it before they knew what hit them. Um, in the other case, you don't work for a big bank, do you? Yeah. So we actually did that research, produced the paper, and had it in front of um, the powers that be. And they, they, it, the whole processes around compliance and all that, legitimate. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I mock it and I make fun of it. It's all totally legitimate. I'm not being, um, I, I don't mean, I hope it doesn't sound der derisive. But there, that whole pipeline takes so long that um, being done, you know, didn't really, again, come up. If you're asking, like, from a data science perspective, when are you done? Um, we're not done. We're never done. We, but we were able to start delivering value. So we were able to say, hey, we're trading too fast. Hey, we got this really cool thing about the ETFs. We can show that it's for real. Um, but we continue to work. My colleague is, is producing that C++ code to hopefully give back to the community that helped us out. Uh, we intend to use this model as sort of a, a foundational um, for a lot of the stuff we do, because everything is observational. Has to be, because we can't do experimentation with client money. Um, so we intend to be incrementally improving this process. We did all this work with Scikit. You can get in the internals of Scikit and pull this stuff off but it doesn't really do what we want it to do, hence the C++ code. But if we didn't do that increment of value, that would have been a problem, right? To, oh, we'll be done any minute now. No, so we, we try to hold it. We try to start delivering value as soon as we possibly can. So to what extent does compliance dig into the details of your model and your data in order to have an understanding before they say that you are in compliance? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's, we're on the same team, right? Um, and I, and I, I, you know, we're, we're, we're jabbing at each other all the time, but we're on the same team. So, and they recognize that they are not statisticians. So they look to us to provide uh, references. Um, they ask questions at, in their uh, language and in, they expect us to answer back in their language, right? And that sort of falls to us to to make that translation. Can you give an example of the kind of questions they ask? Yes. Let me see. Um, that's a great question. So, with the uh, yes, with again, I'm going to give you a trivial one, and I'll give you a more sophisticated one. With the uh, ETF trading, they asked whether we could produce a citation that was as close to as possible representative of what we had done with the, with the algorithm. And they, they pulled away the weeds and said, there's like an algorithm at the center of this thing? There's, a, that, that's, there's like a recipe in there? Yes, okay, show me somebody using that that did the same thing. And you know, we were able to, to cite the, the paper here. Um, trivial and you know, they, don't, they don't know. They don't know what a good question is, so they ask a lot of questions. Um, so, uh, in this in this slide, I have footnotes all over the place on things that if I don't know, is everybody getting like a copy of the slide? Is that part of this? Well, if you don't, anyway, let me see if I can. Um, you've probably seen the little footnotes all over. Uh, this slide here. I got questions. What are the blue dots? How do you answer that? What are the blue dots? 
That's a very difficult question to answer to somebody who is the compliance uh, profession. Um, so you know, you do your best, and they recognize when you're sort of staring at them, with the blinky eyes, and and they say, "Oh, I probably asked a dumb question." They move on. So um, it's a challenge, but it's one that we're able to solve because we are working together. Yeah. Yes? So my question is more around, uh, what does this look like in deployment? Uh, are you, is your deployment basically being insights back to your trading team? And how often do you need to monitor and rerun your model? How do you do that? Yeah, so we're just getting started. We're building this from the ground up. We don't currently have a pipeline of model um, construction, automated model construction, validation, and uh, evaluation. So none of that is, has been built. Did I mention we're hiring? Um, so we're looking for software engineers. We're looking for data scientists. So uh, we're, we're starting that. I have some experience in that. So I could tell you how I've done that elsewhere. But it wouldn't be relevant to here, and maybe after we can talk. Okay, so uh, thank you very much.